Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Telebration Part 1. The Institute Library Story Share Group has, is part of this celebration. The Institute Library Story Share Group is organized by Arnie Pritchard, a historian and story, an incredible storyteller himself. And we meet once a month throughout the year. It is open to all tellers, new and experienced. This celebration is a, don't, uh, a benefit for the Institute Library. So we ask you to please consider making a donation to the Institute Library by going to institutelibrary.org. Tonight, we have some fabulous stories for you. The first is with Nina Lasiga, who has told stories on PBS's Stories from the Stage, The Story Space, and Generation Women. She leads the bi-monthly Bridgeport Story Exchange and is one of the organizers of the visual storytelling event, Pachacacha Night Bridgeport at the Barnum Museum. Tonight, Nina is telling her story, Lift, and separate. Thank you. Some are round, some are flat, some are uneven, and some are droopy, but my mama's titties were pointed. They were like two circus tents turned on their side, ejecting from her, her chest. My mommy swore by the power of Playtex bras to lift and separate her titskies. It was 1961 in Brooklyn, New York. I was five years old, seated in our tiny kitchen. My mom was there making breakfast in her nightgown. All oh, the room smelled of smoky bacon and eggs and slightly burnt toast. She served me and said, Ninochka. Enjoy your breakfast. I'll be right back. And she stepped into the next room to get changed. I took a few bites and I got lonely. Mommy, what are we going to do today? Mommy comes back and she's wearing her skirt, but she is naked from the waist up. Her titskis are long with big nipples and their nipples are facing towards the floor. I just couldn't understand. Her, you know, without clothes, her titskis looked like an old lady's. But when she was dressed, they were young and perky and beautiful. She said, oh, we're going to go for a little walk later and perhaps shop. Well, let's wait for your, your two sisters to wake up. It's summertime and there's no rush for them to get up. Daddy stepped in and he seemed very happy and not shocked that mommy was half naked. He gave her a goodbye smooch and then went off to work to catch the train. My mommy was beautiful. She was tall. She had dirty blonde hair and she had the lightest of blue eyes that sparkled when she spoke. She was confident and she had style. I loved it whenever she told me stories about her as a teenager. She would often ride on the handlebars of guys' bikes. They would fight over her. She was flirty and she never learned how to ride a bicycle or a car. She said someone was always willing to give her a lift. My mommy, attended the famous Parsons School of Art and Design. Her dream was to become a fashion designer. She always wore these slim dresses with scoop neck that she said just tastefully showed a little bit of her cleavage. And she accessorized it with a handbag and pointy shoes. The hem of that dress was just slightly above her knees. And uh, she got dressed up no matter where she went in the neighborhood, it just didn't matter. And she made us dresses that matched hers. Ours would be fitted on the top with big wide skirts with crinolines with a sash in the front that tied in the back. But the women in our neighborhood didn't care much for mommy. They talked behind her back, they they made crumpled faces, especially 
when mom looked Russian to her children, they looked nothing like mommy or acted anything like mommy. They actually wore these pedal pusher pants all the time that went under the knees and then these shirts that buttoned up all the way the neck. They just didn't, they just didn't approve. And they said, and they, they said all kinds of things like, oh, she's a gypsy, she's a, a free spirit, not meaning to be a compliment, of course. I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I just wished we were like everyone else. I just wanted to fit in. Well, at 11 o'clock, mommy took me and my sisters downstairs, and we, um, my younger sister and I went into the stroller. It was Cadillac brand. It was shiny, black with white, big wheels. And my older sister would hold onto the side of the buggy as we left. Outside, it was gray. It was gray sidewalks, gray parking meters, gray storefronts. But when we went a block away, it was so colorful. There were Victorian houses and manicured lawns, lots of flowers and lawn ornaments. There was so much to look at that the time, it took us a half an hour um, to get to the butcher shop. Well, outside she parked that carriage and we held hands and we went inside the butcher shop and it always smelt of kielbasa and garlic. And inside were these white and and glass gleaming counters. And the man behind the counter was all in white, white shirt, white pants, white hat, and white apron. He said, hi, what can I do for you? Mommy said, I would like a quarter pound of ham, please. Then she turns and says something to us in Russian. And I don't really know Russian. I only know one word, marajana, ice cream. And I get the sense that if me and my sisters do what she wants us to do, there's an ice cream in it for us. So he slices the, the ham and dangles it in front of us and said, is this thick enough? And mommy said, yes. And then we all said, Mommy, we're hungry. When are we going to eat lunch? And mommy said, soon girls, don't worry. And he slices off another two slices of meat and gives us all free slice. A quarter pound of bologna, please, my mother instructed. He slices a, pound, a piece of bologna. Is this thick enough? Mommy, we're hungry. When are we going to eat? Soon, girls, please be patient. And the butcher, he slices another two slices of meat and gives us the meat. Well, what I noticed is every time Mommy ordered something, she bent over and her titskies popped up just a little bit. And the man was just getting happier. Oh, I would like that chicken in the showcase. That's going to be great for dinner. And he takes the chicken and he puts it on the scale and he goes, it's over three pounds. But you know what? Let's just call it three pounds. Well, we went home and as promised, mommy fed us lunch. She first said, now girls, you had the meat in your sandwich. So here's the bread, the cucumber, tomato, and mayonnaise. And like, I was confused. I was disappointed. I was speechless because she was kind of right. We lived from paycheck to paycheck. Daddy got paid on, on Friday. And so by Thursday, we ran out of money. Instead of playing with paper dolls, my mom used to occupy us by helping, asking us to help her cut out coupons, which then we would use on Friday night. We always went shopping on Friday night to the supermarket. Well, mommy really loved finding free things to do. And sometimes she invited her girlfriend and two children. For example, one of our favorite things to do was to go to Rockefeller Center to visit the NBC studios to see a television taping. This day, we all went out. 
we got to the subway station and four of the five children were eligible for you know free rides and one at a time they would just duck under the turnstile until it was my turn and the ticket the token booth man says hey how old is that one and my mother goes oh she's five she's going to be six in october he says that's hard to believe and i see mommy bending over so her titskis pop up just a little bit oh you're the mother you should know oh have a good day and she pays for my older sister and we get to, we get on the train well at the nbc studios there was a long line waiting to the, the the entrance when it was our turn the man said tickets please and mommy bent over to look in her handbag and she says something to it, us in russian and i don't understand what it is but i get the sense that if we do what she wants us to do there's an ice cream in it for us and she goes girls i can't believe it mommy left the tickets on the kitchen counter and we go mommy why did you do that now we're not going to see the show and she bends over to look for tissues to dry our tears. And the man goes, oh, it was an accident. Why don't you come on in? Well, mommy never had a ticket for the TV shows. This next time we went to see a clown show and it was at seven o'clock in the morning and we got there just in time and she goes into her handbag about to like look for her tickets and the man goes hey i remember you you come here all the time without tickets i want to let you know that for this show there are no tickets this is an employee appreciation show for their children but i don't want to disappoint your children come on in well years later I was seated on a, on a beach blanket at Coney Island Beach facing the ocean. And we were there, my mother, her three children, and also her, girl, her best girlfriend and her two children. And it was time to have lunch. And I'm holding up the most delicious looking sandwich. And it has meat in it this time. Um, the bread was crispy Italian bread. And um, it actually came fresh from the bakery that morning. Her best girlfriend, her husband was a baker and he just baked it that very morning. And as I'm about to take the first bite, I'm thinking, wait a minute, do you remember all the times we went to the butcher and got all this free meat? And my mother's girlfriend goes, what butcher? Mommy goes, the one in our neighborhood, the one on Church Avenue. She says, I never got any free meat. From hearing that, I realized that my mom did what she could to have us fed and give us all the experiences of a rich and full life. I was so embarrassed when I was young about how my mommy acted and how she was perceived. And that just lifted. My mommy had talent. She knew how to use her sex appeal and her beauty to get us things we couldn't otherwise afford. I appreciated her. I felt gratitude. I felt so loved. Thank you. Nina, that's wonderful. I love that story. I love all the stories about your family. This one about your mom is really special. Thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. Our, our next teller is Wendy Marins with Please Don't Stand, Stand So Close to Me. Wendy first told a story in the 2014 at another celebration. That was her first, but not her last. 
and the journey has brought back many memories, created new friendships, and taught her to value the small moments. Wendy is also a speech pathologist by day, a Music Haven board member and a fan. She plays the cello quite nicely, although she will not admit it. <laughs> Quilts and jags, loves to cook, and yesterday she brought home her new puppy, Nora. Wendy, please, thank you. Thank you, Denise. When I was 16, I'd been living in Cheshire with my family just for two years, and my father announced he was going to leave his job. He couldn't stomach the dubious ethics of his boss anymore. He had, in fact, already quit. And he was applying to jobs that were much further south, but didn't yet know whether he would get an interview, let alone the job. Either way, we were going to have to move. And I felt as though the bottom fell out of my world. I love Cheshire. I was about to go into the equivalent of my junior year of high school, the last two years that would determine where and whether I went to college and my future career path. But I had no control. They put the house on the market and to everyone's surprise, it sold the first day, which meant that we were actually temporarily homeless and didn't even know where we were going to be living. It seemed to me that my dad wasn't exactly in the driver's seat either. My parents' friends, Eddie and Maureen, who lived just outside of Cambridge, also in England, reached out and suggested that we could come and live with them while my father sorted out what was happening in their large farmhouse just outside of Cambridge. That way, they all figured, I could at least start school and not miss these critical few months. What nobody thought to check was whether or not that would work. And when we got there, we found that because we weren't permanent residents, I did not compute as far as the Cambridge school system was concerned. And so no, actually, I could not go to school. I discovered it is a very hard thing to be absolutely furious with your parents when you're living in someone else's house at rather close quarters. And just to clarify this, this was not a farmhouse set in the midst of rolling pastoral English countryside. No, no. The farmland around this farmhouse had been sold off years before to make way for the Cambridge Sewage Works, of which Eddie was the manager. This farmhouse was surrounded by acre upon acre of sewage filtration tanks connected by an intricate series of private roads for the vehicles that serviced the tanks. To make matters worse, the, spot, the house that we were in appeared to be inhabited by thousands of spiders, which had grown to fit the scale of the house and were like medium baked potatoes. And it appeared that every single time I went to leave a room, one of these spiders would be between me and the door, which for an arachnophobe was horrendous. They did serve a function. They saved my relationship with my mother, who surprisingly turned out to be a spider warrior woman. She'd hear me shriek and she'd appear with a broom and actually sometimes pick the potato-sized spider up and hurl it into the nearest toilet, which is why our relationship didn't get flushed along with the spider. Instead, my venomous rage was solely directed at my father, who in the way that probably only a 16-year-old can, I felt had ruined my life, not just now, but permanently. So I just stopped talking to him. I sent him to Coventry. And I think in an attempt to salvage our relationship, he suggested to me that I could learn to drive a year before I was legally allowed to, because we had access to this intricate road ser series in the sewage works. I loved driving and I was good at driving and it gave me a sense of power that had been significantly lacking. 
And after about a month, my dad said, you know, you're pretty good. I'm going to let you take the car out anytime you want when it's available, as long as you stick to the roads in the system, which I did in the driver's seat on my own. Most of the territory on which I was driving was flat, but they had built a turnaround road at an at a, an incline. And it was there that I learned the balancing maneuver of throttle cl clutch, throttle clutch, when you are doing a stick shift and you don't want to use the handbrake. And I loved that I could get it so that it was hovering in one position for as long as I wanted it to, and then I could just touch the accelerator. About a month later, my father got a job. We moved 40 miles away to Bedford, and I was enrolled in a school. And then when I turned 17, my father suggested that maybe having some real driver's lessons would be important since I was going to be on public roads with other vehicles, and I agreed. The man who was gonna give me my lesson showed up at the house in a dual control car, showing how confident he was in his students. And he was probably somewhere between my father's age and my grandfather's age. We set off, everything was going fine. And after half an hour, we were on a side road that had a very steep camber to it. It was the perfect road in which to practice a three-point turn using the clutch, throttle balance, and the handbrake. I was excited about this. I thought I could show off. But he actually said, just pull into the curb and park, which I obediently did. And then, to my absolute horror, I felt his hand on my thigh. I thought I might throw up. I went into a cold sweat and I could feel my heart. I thought he would probably see how hard my heart was beating and I couldn't move. And I think it was so awkward that he didn't do anything else until about three minutes later, he said, oh, just drive home. I drove home. I got out of the car as fast as I could. And then I went inside. The driving experience for me had been solid forever. Those few words he had said, let's take a minute. I didn't step into a driver's side of a car again for four more years when a very kind boyfriend who loved cars as much as he loved me gently nudged me along to taking my driver's test when I was 21. But I was living in London and I didn't really need a car until around the time I was 25. And I realized I was so tired of coming home late and catching the late night last tube. It felt nerve wracking and probably what I was rightly slightly anxious about it. And either I was doing that or I was leaving somewhere early so I didn't have to catch that particular tube or I was relying on friends because I couldn't afford cabs. And I thought I was really overdue in getting a car of my own. So as someone with limited funds, I had three options, a Citroen 5, a Renault 4, or a VW Beetle. And I settled on the Renault 4. For those of you who may not know this particular model, which has long been discontinued, it looked like a small shoebox on wheels. They were nearly always white. And it had this very strange gear stick, which looked as though somebody had taken a right angled walking stick and shoved it into the dashboard. And it worked with a series of push pulls ratchet system. Um, it also had an engine that was maybe as powerful as my Bonina sewing machine, but much less reliable. And on every single one that I looked at, there was a metal plate welded to the driver's side floor because the, the metal that the car was built of was so fragile that it disintegrated at the sight of rain. And I loved my car. The day I drove it home, 
I was living in a flat in Hampstead in North London with a very steep hill. And I was a little apprehensive about parking it and very relieved to find there was a space right outside the flat that was at least the length of my car and another half vehicle. So I did a parallel reverse in, feeling slightly hot and sweaty because I hadn't done it in a while, and worried that I might get too, car, too close to the car behind me. In fact, what happened was I ended up a bit too close to the car in front. So I needed to reverse. And of course, that required the throttle clutch maneuver. I was not in much practice. And what would happen would be I would get the perfect hover, but at that point I needed to sort of gun the accelerator a little bit to go backwards. And I kept chickening out and jamming my foot on the brake, but not before the car had edged forward just a few inches. And by the time I had done this four times, getting more nervous every time, there was two and a half inches between me and the car in front and two and a half feet between me and the car behind. There happened to be a guy walking by and I got out of the car and I called to him. I am mortified by this. I called to him and I said, excuse me, could you reverse my car? I didn't ask him if he could drive. I didn't ask him if he'd ever driven a Renault 4 before with the weird gear lever. It never crossed my mind that the guy could get in my car and drive off with it. Anyway. Within about a week or so, I was fine and back on form driving the car. And a friend of mine, Robin, who lived in South London and was co-hosting a party, asked if I would go down and take part. I said, sure, much to my joy, I could drive myself there. I got down there and I didn't know his group of friends very well. And I walked into the kitchen and there was this gaggle of women who weren't especially welcoming. And when I asked where Robin was, he said, they said, the boys are down at the pub and proceeded to get incredibly drunk really quickly and increasingly pissed off at the fact that the boys in fact were down at the pub until closing time. And by the time they came back in, it was very clear this party was going downhill fast and it was time for me to go home. I found Robin, said goodnight, and I went upstairs to gather my stuff, including my coat with the car keys in it. I didn't notice the man who followed me up the stairs. I didn't notice anybody until I heard the door close behind me. I turned around and this stranger was there and he said, where are you going? Home, I said. He took a step closer. It's not time to go home yet, he said. Oh, I think it is, I said. And he stepped closer again and he put his hand on my shoulder and I felt a familiar sense of feeling nauseous and sweaty and anxious. Let's take a few minutes, he said, then I'll drive you home. I shrugged his hand off my shoulder, grabbed my coat, elbowed past him down the stairs, struggling to find my keys in the pocket of my jacket. I opened the front door, glad that my car was only about three doors down, and tried not to run, fumbling as I opened the car door, locking it and turning the engine on. And it was only then that I looked in the rearview mirror. He was standing there, grinning, leaning on the gatepost. I pulled out of the parking space and gunned it down the street. And about half a mile on, I realized I could still hear my heart pounding, but I also realized this wasn't fear, this was exhilaration. I burst into, please don't stand so close to me by the police and I sang it at the top of my lungs all the way home in my small white shoebox of a car, finally in my own driver's seat. Thank you.
That is wonderful. It's a very compelling piece. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thanks, Denise. Our next teller is Becky Paw. She tells these incredible stories about growing up on her family farm in Montana. You feel like you're there with her and her six sisters. Tonight, she is looking forward to telling us, uh, sharing a story called Sapphire. Becky? Thanks, Denise. Throughout my lifetime, I've subscribed to all kinds of theories about why bad things happen. The faith-based explanation is, all things happen for a reason. An optimist's explanation is, well, the universe is providing me with an opportunity to learn from this moment. Lately, I find myself sticking to a personal long-held theory, which is people suck. Now, over time, I've moved up and down the axis of various philosophical theories on the topic of why bad things happen. And in fact, lately, I can move all the way up and down the entire spectrum over the course of an hour on any given day. And all of this ruminating brings to mind a favorite story of mine. Now, here are the important facts. My beloved grandparents, who were Methodists, had a family Bible that shared a shelf with their copy of the roadside geology of Montana. So when I think of my grandparents, I think of the Methodist church and rocks. When my grandparents passed the family farm on to the next generation, they began their retirement with little day trips here and there to collect trilobite fossils or to search for Montana agate. Their passion for rock collecting eventually led to longer road trips to the southern border and north to Alaska in search of quartzite and turquoise and petrified wood. They traveled in a little small camper that was on the back of their pickup truck, the kind that had a, a small area that extended over the top of the truck cab that served as the sleeping quarters. Think of it as the original tiny house, but much, much smaller and stuffed with hundreds of pounds of rock. One extremely hot summer day when I was about four or five, my older sister, Cindy, 10 years older than me, we were invited to take an impromptu overnight trip with grandma and grandpa to a special destination. They were in search of the coveted and very rare Yogo Sapphire, which can only be found in the Yogo Gulch in the state of Montana. Now it was yours for the taking if you were lucky enough and determined enough to find it. I don't really know what prompted them to bring us along. Maybe they thought we might offer an advantage with our keen youthful vision, but we were excited. And I grabbed my swimsuit, my toothbrush and off we went. And the four of us were squished into the sticky vinyl bench seat in the front of the pickup truck, bumping along a dusty road. Me covered head to toe in hives and calamine lotion from a blistering heat rash. I was in heaven. Now sapphire hunting is tedious work, or so I've been told. I was primarily spending my time splashing around in the freezing cold lake, but I do remember that the pebbles were dredged from the bottom of the lake, placed in a rectangular box with a screen on the bottom and swished around in the water to remove the sediment. And then with a pair of tweezers or little five-year-old fingers, you searched for anything that might catch your eye with a, with a bit of light. After about two days, we had filled several tiny bottles with our various sapphire prizes, but only one was a yogo. And my sister Cindy had found it. And that was the beginning of a tradition. Grandma and Grandpa had 11 granddaughters. And between us, there were enough stones found for every single one of us to get a piece of jewelry as a gift. 
Grandma and Grandpa took Cindy to the jeweler and had her sapphire made into a stunning ring. Now, if you're not familiar with sapphires, they can come in all shapes and sizes. They can be pink or green or yellow, but the Yogo Sapphire is an exceptional gem. They're considered to be the finest sapphires in the world. They're this incredibly bright royal blue, unique in all the world. And urban legend has it that Princess Diana had them in her crown. It was impressed upon all of us that this was a very valuable thing in every sense of the word. The stone itself, and in that it was a gift from my grandparents. And for me and Cindy, that it was a tangible token of a special shared experience. So later, when Cindy was in the bathroom of the Methodist church, she slipped off her ring to wash her hands and forgot to put it back on. Realizing a mistake, she went back to find out that it was gone. Someone had taken it. Someone had stolen her sapphire ring out of the Methodist church bathroom. And the ring was lost forever. It's been gone almost 50 years, and my sister still winces at the memory of losing it. I remember my sister Shirley chose a garnet ring when her time came, and taking heed of Cindy's tragic outcome, she opted to rarely wear her ring and instead kept it hidden to ensure its safety, which worked very well for her until her college apartment was broken into, and it too was never to be seen again. My younger sister Kathy and I were the last of the 11 granddaughters. And when we were deemed sufficiently mature and responsible, my grandmother took us to the jeweler together. The remaining sapphires were the dribs and drabs that were left. Not that we cared in the slightest, but Kathy and I were permitted to have rings made of three stones. I suppose as consolation for the fact that these sapphires had little monetary value. Now my three stones were small. One was green, one was gray, and one was yellow, and they were put in a setting in a row. And my younger sister Kathy's three stones were all different sizes and set in a, in a beautiful asymmetrical pattern. Now my sister Cindy wore her ring and took it off. And that ended badly. My sister Shirley did not wear her ring and that ended badly. So my strategy was put it on and never ever take it off. As the years went by, my grandparents passed away but they were with me always every time I looked at my hand. Time went on and I noticed that the band was growing thin and fragile. And I was headed home for a family visit to Montana and I had plans to go camping and hiking and horseback riding. And I was worried that it, was, it would break while I was out in the wilderness or out in the pasture and never ever be found. So I made a difficult decision to remove the ring from my finger and leave it in my jewelry box while I was traveling. And I remember my finger felt so strange and naked without it. And I was very eager to get home and have it repaired. But alas, during my vacation, someone had cleverly scaled the wall and entered my apartment from the second story screened in porch and had taken my jewelry box. Nothing else, just my jewelry box. And I remember thinking, all things happen for a reason. And I remember thinking, the universe is providing me with an opportunity to learn from this moment. And I remember thinking, people suck. And I think it's all true. The story of not one, not two, but three of us having our rings stolen by someone else who could not possibly understand the significance of these rings 
made me angry and cynical about humankind. And my naked finger was a constant reminder. So this is the part in the story where you get to imagine a happy ending where the police find the robber who took it and they're able to return it to me. Or I finally find the ring at that pawn shop on State Street. But that didn't happen. I never saw the ring again. Six months later, I flew home to Montana for Christmas with my family. It's a big family, lots of people, lots of presents. And we'd finally finished opening all of the gifts. And there was a very small box under the tree. And someone said, oh, there, look, there's one more for Becky. I was completely perplexed. I couldn't imagine what was in the box. But it was from my younger sister, Kathy. And inside was a sapphire. I was incredibly touched. How sweet, I thought. She bought me a sapphire to replace my lost sapphire. But no, that's not what happened. She had taken her ring to the jeweler and had it broken apart so that she could give me one of her sapphires. And now when I look at my finger, I see not only my grandparents, but my sister Kathy and her selfless act of love. And I never, ever take it off. Thank you for letting me tell my story. That is so lovely and the love from your sister. Uh, I mean, I think we can all relate to losing things and that are so dear to us. And that was really sweet that your sister gave that back to you. What a beautiful story. Thank you so much. Thanks, Denise. Our next teller is Kevin Ewing. Rev Kev, as many of us know him. And he has been telling stories all his life, but never thought of himself as a storyteller. It was only recently that he realized what he did naturally is an actual discipline. He brings a vast array of personal stories from his own experiences as being a police officer, an army reserve officer, an inner city community organizer, a minister, and living as a black man in America. He loves sharing folk stories and using his gifts to spread the stories of the voiceless. And he particularly loves reinterpreting the stories of the Bible and other historical texts. Kevin, is a firm believer that the story is a tool that leads to better understanding. And with to that end, he founded Baobab Tree Studios, which is a media content creation service. He's also the person and Baobab are the people who are bringing you this production tonight. Uh, Kevin is involved in so many community organizations and on boards and advisory communities. Uh, he's a very busy man. And in his free time, when he has it, he chills on his sailboat. His story tonight is white, the white per people whisperer. Kevin? I've known for most of my life that one of my calls, one of my purposes, one of the reasons I've been placed on this earth is to make it possible for several white people to say, you know, one of my good friends is black. Have you met Kevin? They call him Rev Kev. Now I know black people and down white folks hear me say that and go, what in the hell is this fool talking about? And the rest of you go, that's right. He's my friend, Rev Kev. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> I love you all, bless your hearts. But it's true. I've always known it. And I wasn't sure what to say about it. A few years ago, I was working with some dudes in the Hill neighborhood. Now, all of them had histories with the criminal justice system, and most lived straddling the lines of legality. They weren't physically hurting or robbing anybody anymore. But you might not want to dig too deep into where and how they acquired that thing, if you know what I mean. All of them also recognized that 
that they'd messed up and were determined to give their sons and grandsons better opportunities. So we were tossing around ideas of programs and projects we could start from our community. But we always ran up against one obstacle, money. We didn't have any. But as we tossed out ideas, I started thinking of people we could ask. And I started saying, hey, we might be able to ask so-and-so for this, or we might be able to find the money here. And one of them looked at me and was like, wow, Rev Kev, you're really good at getting white people to give up money. And another one said, yeah, you're like a white people whisperer. Wow. That struck a nerve. And I wasn't sure what to say about it. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now, I don't know if you know much about St. Louis, but it straddles the Mason-Dixon line. It was then when I lived there, and it is in many ways still a very segregated city. The races don't mix, not really. White folks stayed with white folks, black folks stayed with black folks. And the few Spanish-speaking folks, we call them all Mexicans. Uh, I don't know what they did. They did their own thing. Then the Civil Rights Act opened up a lot of opportunities for us black kids to join the programs that were already existing on the other side of town for the white kids. So at nine or 10 years old, my mother would put me in the van with five or six other little black kids at the Herbert Hoover Boys Club to go to a program on the literal other side of the track. And there, I got to experience white culture. I learned to ice skate. Yeah, a brother played hockey. I learned crew and played water polo. You know, white people sports. I formed friendships with white kids. I get invited into their homes. I got to know them. I got to peek and sometimes actually step inside their inner circle. And so, though my feet were planted firmly in the black culture of my neighborhood, I also felt comfortable in the so-called white culture. I learned to navigate both. What a blessing. I knew it, but I didn't know what to say about it. Not too long ago, I was watching the excellent documentary I Am Not Your Negro, about James Baldwin. He was talking about how his young white elementary school teacher would take him and a few of his classmates from Harlem to lower Manhattan and expose them to galas and art galleries and theater and opera, a world ordinarily reserved for white people. Baldwin's experience was very much like mine. He grew up in both worlds. Now, when he told the story, he had run away to Paris to escape the hatred and, str and strife of being black in the United States. And he was watching his friends and colleagues on the front lines of the civil rights movement. He knew he had to go back. He knew he had a role. He knew he had to join the fight. At first, he wasn't sure how. But then he figured it out. See, he had a unique gift to offer the movement. He said, because of my upbringing, I never learned to hate white people. He understood them, but more importantly, he was able to make them understand him. He knew them and they knew him. So in the fight between us and then he saw a possibility that we could all be us. A racist post on social media by a white man that got called out and went viral turned out to be written by an officer at my yacht club. Yeah, brother's a member of a yacht club. I told you, white people sports. Now, I know the dude. I actually like him. More than once, he has gone out of his way to help me. His boat is two slips down from mine. 
I've shed drinks with him on his boat. But for some reason, he posted on Facebook using a horrible racial slur, a call for the lynching of protesters in the Black Lives Matter movement. He said their lives don't matter. Now, because of this, I and the two other black members of the 300 member club called for his dismissal. So they had a meeting. I couldn't attend. So I sent a letter. In the letter, I basically said, folks, you know me. I'm Kevin, Rev Kev. I've dined at your tables. I've been in some of your houses. I consider all of you my friends. Did you not recognize that I am a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement? That I am one of those protesters? So can you really stand there and look me in my face and advocate for my murder? You know me. Do you really want to see me lynched? Because that's what that post calls for. Are you really saying that my life doesn't matter? That night and the next day, several members called and said my words swayed their vote. I don't like it, they said, but I understand. You're my friend and I'm sorry. I said, thank you. That's a good start. He was moved, removed from his position but not removed from the club. Yesterday, I got a phone call saying that he tried to run again for rear commodore at a meeting that I was again not able to attend. Fortunately, he was voted down. And not only did they vote him down, but they voted to change the bylaws to say that anyone removed from office for cause cannot run again for five years. And then they asked me to join the Board of Governors. <laughs> Maybe I am a white people whisperer. And there are many more of us out there. And I'll be honest, it kind of sucks. But it's my call, my purpose, one of the reasons I've been placed on this earth. And I know exactly what to say about it now. Hi, my name is Kevin. They call me Ref Cal. Let's be friends. Thank you. No, thank you. That was an incredibly powerful story. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I've learned a lot from storytelling just listening to you. Thank you very, very much. Our next teller is Jennifer Monroe with her story and bitch. <laughs> nationally, Jennifer is a nationally known storyteller. She tells stories that celebrate ordinary heroes of everyday life. Her book of short stories, Aunt Lily, and other delightfully perverse stories is available on Amazon. And her three award-winning CDs are available on her webpage, www.jennifermonroe.net. All of you, you're in for a really wonderful treat. Jennifer. Thank you, Denise. So I do have to use the F word in this story. So if you find that offensive, that's a shame because the story has a great message. Um, but just plug your ears for that part. Years ago, I traveled back to Great Britain to visit a good friend of mine, Maureen. She and I talked together in the East End of London in a very, very challenging school. She had since moved on and was now the deputy headmistress of a school for severely emotionally disturbed children in the same neighborhood. Over dinner one night, she suggested I might like to go into school the next day and tell the kids some stories. Well, just dealing with regular kids in that neighborhood was challenging enough. I couldn't imagine what coping with these children would be like. Um, and I was totally inadequate to the task. 
But to my horror, I found myself saying, I'd love to. And I really didn't sleep that night. The next morning when we arrived at the school, Maureen took out a huge key, put it in the lock, opened the door. We went inside, she locked it behind us. She took out another large key, put it in the lock, opened the door, locked it behind us. It was like being in coal dips. And when we got to the office, pandemonium ruled. Apparently they were short of teachers and hadn't been able to find any substitute teachers. No great surprise there, I thought to myself. Well, apparently being qualified, which I still was, to teach regular kids in Great Britain was good enough for Maureen. She turned to me and said, man the hallways, Jen. If a girl needs to go to the bathroom, go in with her. If a boy needs to go, crack the door and listen at the first time of trouble, don't hesitate to go in. Well, a little taken aback, I nonetheless went out there. And almost immediately, a girl about 12 years of age asked if she could go to the bathroom. Of course, I said, and I followed her inside. Her head spun around and she gave me a look that turned my bowels to water. Ow, you fucking bitch, miss. And without using the bathroom, she flounced out. Well, I was a little surprised by this, but nonetheless heartened by her use of the honorific miss. Well, I went outside and to my great relief, a man had arrived and was helping shepherd the kids into their various classrooms. I think it was the janitor. And then a frantic Maureen reappeared. There's no one to teach the five and six year olds. It's just you and me, Jen. She said it as if we were in a World War II movie about to go over the top. But these were five and six year olds. How bad could it be? I found out later that one of the kids had broken the teacher's nose and it wasn't on and it wasn't by accident. Well, there were only two kids in the classroom, two boys, but Maureen soon had them set to work or play really. One boy was playing in the sandbox and at the other end of the room a boy was playing in the water trough and then I really don't know what happened next but Maureen had wrestled the boy who was playing in the sandbox to the ground she had him pinned around his chest and arms but she was talking to him in a very soothing calm voice and I thought well she's got this under control so I wandered over to the boy who was playing in the water trough. I picked up a little plastic jug and a small ball. I was going to pop it into the jug with the water, you know, to teach him about water displacement, you know, the eureka moment. He sneered at me. And then he made sure that Maureen wasn't looking. And then he lifted his hand out of the water. It was in the shape of a gun and he blew me away. Then he smiled, and I think I preferred the sneer. The next minute, someone was knocking at the door and she had released the sandbox boy. He seemed to have recovered, he was back playing. Maureen went over to the door, she unlocked it. The lock was right at the top so the kids couldn't reach it. It was Millie come to do the lunch count. And as soon as Millie opened the door, the boy who was playing in the water tray shot out when he was my responsibility. I ran down the hallway after him. I remember his little skinny legs were a blur as he was running as fast as he could. He hurled himself against the front door, his fists banging against the wood. I wrapped my arms around his chest, pinning his arms to his sides, and I picked him up. His little legs were kicking furiously, kicking at my shins, but I held on to him. He weighed nothing at all, and I started to talk in a soft, smoothing voice the way I heard Maureen do earlier, and all of a sudden, his little body in my arms went limp. And all of a sudden, too, 
he seemed to weigh a ton. I could barely hold him. And I knew that this was the weight of our collective failure. Well, the rest of the class period went without incident. And I was looking forward to my lunch break, except that they needed someone to supervise the lunch room. There was only about 50 kids in there, but this is when I feared for my life. These children were eating their lunch with metal knives and forks. As a precaution, I stood with my back pressed against the wall and I watched one boy trade his Ritalin for a bag of potato chips. There was one other teacher supervising. I went over and told her what I'd seen and she said, oh, thanks, but that's the least of our worries. And by now, I had a pretty good idea of what the worst of their worries might be. How do you do this every day, I asked. She laughed. Oh, a glass of single malt whiskey as soon as I get home from school usually does the trick. Well, by the time I met with the kids I was supposed to tell stories to, I was a nervous wreck. I watched them as they walked in and slumped disinterestedly into their seats. What stories could I possibly tell these children that would make any difference whatsoever? The girl from the bathroom was there. She didn't even look at me. So I started off telling them a story called Tailybone. It never lets me down, particularly with this age group, even though I found it in a children's picture book. It's just an old jump tale. When you reach the climax, you get really, really quiet. And then you yell as loud as you can. Well, the kids all jump and then they laugh at themselves. And when kids this age group laugh at themselves, then you can tell them stories that they need to hear. But I hadn't reached my second rendition of Tailybone. Tailybone. I want my Tailybone. When I realized these kids were terrified, it was clear to me that they thought that the creature in the story was real. They had no willing suspension of disbelief. Their real lives were so horrific, anything could and did happen. So I backpedaled and I sought around in my head for another story and I came up with Gunny Wolf. It's a story I usually tell to kindergartners where girl outwits wolf. These kids loved it. So I told them the story of Hansel and Gretel. And when Gretel pushes the witch into the oven, a great cheer went up. And in Jack and the Beanstalk, when the magic harp yells, help, help, to warn the giant, a chorus of shut the fuck up rose as one voice. I told fairy tale after fairy tale. The whole thing just became a blur but I reached the end of the session without losing life or limb. I had done it. I had survived and I thought I was done for the day. But no, I had bus duty to do. Turned out to be no big deal. There were only three small bus buses and just like kids any everywhere, there was some pushing and shoving, but they all managed to get onto the various buses safely. And as the last bus was pulling out, a window at the back opened and the 12 year old girl from the bathroom stuck her head out. She was smiling and waving and she yelled, I'm sorry I called you a fucking bitch, miss. <laughs> In some strange way, I felt that I had just been 
forgiven. And as I walked back into the school, I thought to myself, never underestimate the power of a good story. It can quite literally save your life. Thank you. <laughs> that is a really wonderful story and just so uh, wonderful about the fact that what storytelling can do. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Jen. You're welcome. Thank you. So thank you for Jennifer and thank you to all the tellers tonight, Nina, Wendy, Becky, and Kevin. All of your studies, all of your stories were really funny, poignant, powerful. I think we just had an incredibly wonderful night tonight. And thank you our audience for joining in and remember to join us tomorrow for Celebration Part Two. We also ask you to once again, please consider making a donation to the Institute Library by going to institutelibrary.org. Good night, have a wonderful evening, and think about all the stories you might tell.